ቅጡ ዳግቢት ካማር እንታት ሰማይ ቅድስታ ቅዱሳን ወውስቴታ ስላተ ኪዳን አሰርቱ ካላት ኢሁ ለእግዚአብሔር ቀዲሙ ዘነወነ በያውታ እንታይቲ ከዳሜስሙ ለመዳኒና ኢየሱስ ክርስቶስ ዘተ ሰባ መንኪ ዘን ወለውናቲ ወኾነ አራቂ ላዲስ ኪዳን ወይ ዘደሙ ቅዱስ አንሶሆሙ ለማህየምና ወለህዝብ ንሱሃን ሰዓሊ ለና ቅዱስ in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit uh, one god amen uh hello brothers and sisters in christ a uh, happy sunday uh truly this is the first day of the week and the greatest day of the week and so may thanks be to god who brought us together and gathered us together to celebrate this holy day uh consecrated to the lord uh today we're joined by our brother known to all of us very well uh diakon hinok uh diakon hinok how are you doing on this blessed sunday doing well glory be to god thank you for having me again on this program provided by our lovely home parish uh which we will happen to be the hometown heroes of the virgin mary's ethiopian orthodox tawahedo cathedral <laughs> well thank you thank you very much you know uh this program is as much yours as it is you know all of ours because you know again uh we are from the same parish we are brothers in the ministry and so uh we're always happy whenever uh we get to to collaborate to uh to build off one another uh in our ministry. Uh so today as usual we're going to continue on with our series. Today is going to be the last unique part of our series. Uh, we'll circle back on Tuesday to finish off what we didn't finish, but today we are technically finishing um you know our reflections on uh with Dasimaram and we're going to do that by reflecting on what is uh, known to be the hymn of the greatest day the hymn of sendata christian of the sabbath of christians of sunday uh but as always before we can uh go into the reflection um it's always necessary that we offer up our prayers to god so that he can give us uh enlightenment on these divine mysteries uh so dakwan hino could you care to lead us uh, in prayer to open up our program In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Believing and trusting in the Holy Trinity and standing in the presence of our Holy Mother the Church, we deny you Satan and for this Mariam's Eon is our witness forever and ever. We bless you, Lord, and we thank you. We glorify you. We offer you praise and worship and ask for you to reveal to us how you moved through Holy Ephraim the Syrian, and we hope that through his writings on Our Lady, the Holy Virgin Mary, we may be able to properly ask for her intercession in our lives so she can think about us and we can think about her and all of us can focus our eyes especially the eyes of our heart on you allow us to deeply praise you and worship you at all time and be with us and we'll pray to you as you taught us how to pray saying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. With the salutation of Saint Gabriel, the angel, O our Lady Mary, peace be unto you. You are a virgin in your thoughts and a virgin in your flesh. Blessed art thou amongst all women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Rejoice, joyful one, for God is with thee. Pray and beseech your beloved Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, that he may grant us mercy and forgive us our sins. Glory be to the Father, glory be to the Son, and glory be to the Holy Spirit, both now and evermore. Amen. Thank you for the beautiful prayer. Uh, so as usual, uh, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen so that uh, we can all see together uh, the praise of uh, the Virgin Mary in all three tongues, in all three languages, uh, the original Guz, the Amarinya, as well as the English. So that's it. Uh, here we are. So I guess without further ado, we might as well just hop in to the first stanza. Kadus uh, Ephraim says for us, Tasameki Thakrita, O Burekam Anist. You was named the beloved woman, O blessed among women. You are the second chamber and that you were called the holiest of holies. You are the table of the covenant, and on it were the 10 words, the 10 commandments, which are written by the finger of God. He made known this to us, first of all, by Yota, which is the first letter of the name of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who became incarnate of you without change and became the mediator of the new covenant. And by the shedding of his holy blood, he purified the believers and the people who were pure. O Holy Mary, pray for us. Uh, what are your thoughts on this, Diakonheno? I want to uh, first uh, come to you, and then you can open it up. Thank you. It's very interesting, this yota, this Greek transliteration. For those who don't know, transliteration is when you take something from one language and you make it go splat on another language without actually putting it in a translation, without actually interpreting it. When you just say the word, we have many words like this. Paraglitos is not a translation, it's a transliteration. Yota is like this. Petros, Paulos, a lot of these Greek terms, we often do that. We maintain the original term. So just going to a few of the good terms before we go to the Greek. She's called Kertist, Fikerta, Burikt. They're, they're synonyms. She's Kertist means she's a holy woman. She's set apart. She's different. She's unique. She's distinct. She's distinguished. There's something that's not so normal about her. And that is, she is chosen as the vessel of the Most High God, something that no one else has ever been chosen to do. In fact, I think it's not in this one. We'll, we'll get to it. Oh, no, it is here. Uh, so not just kadist. But the holy of holies, which brings back this imagery to the temple worship of the Jews in the Older Testament. And Fakirta means that she's beloved. Later on, we'll get to Jesse, who is the father of David. And David, of course, means Yetawaddida, wit. You could hear it even in the word. The V's and W's are interchangeable, often in Semitic tongues. And so even when we see David or Dawood, you can hear yatawaddida, wood, expensive, valuable, beloved, cherished, someone that uh, they're really looking after. And so being of this line, Our Lady Mary is also like that. She's, she's holy, she is beloved, and she's burikt, she's blessed. And we'll see oftentimes in Sundays, Uddasi Mariam or Marian praise, not just blessed, right? Blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are all these, right? But she is blessed amongst all women. We say it in our, in our prayer as well, that we attach to the Lord's prayer. So she is not only blessed, which is happy or has God's favor, but she's more blessed than all other people because she is beloved, because she is holy. And all of this goes to why? Because inside her is the instruction of God who wore flesh, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It all points back to her act, her function as Theotokos, as mother of God, as God-bearer. And 
when you get to the Greek, what's so interesting is it, it's to get to the original writing of the New Testament and, of course, the first translation of the Old Testament, where in Greek, and iota is a letter. It's the letter used to write the name Iesus. And so iota is the first letter of his name. And so in the, the fact that they're actually quoting the Greek is like a reminder to go read the Old Testament in Greek and to read the New Testament in Greek because it's telling us, you know, this is not the only language in usage here. We got some Greek, so you got to consider what the role of Greek is. And for those who, who speak in English, you know, sometimes they say, I have no iota of respect. I mean, someone doesn't even have a little bit of respect because of the way in which in the Bible, the iota is written in a small way. Later in English idiomatic language, it came to mean that. And it shows that, oh, it's not just Henok who's obsessed with words and who loves words, but here, Gaddus Ephraim is so obsessed with words, he's talking about Greek. Why does he need to step aside and talk to us in Greek? Why couldn't he just say it to us in Guz? What's going on here? And uh, finally, I am by trade a mediator. So when I see Harake Lahadis Kidan, you know, I always get excited. Um, you know, my, my profession is used parabolically for what the Lord has done for us. And some people have issue with this because they misunderstand the incarnation, but he is perfectly God and he is perfectly human. He is perfectly a judge who judges, but he's also perfectly a reconciliator, a mediator, a shumagli, an elder, a peacemaker, an advocate, a lawyer, whatever word we want to use. He's both of those things. And we have to accept that. And it has nothing to do with him sort of bowing and praying now where he is, but it has everything to do with that precious holy blood that he shed on our behalf one time for all times. Like his beatitude, Abu Nabarnabas always says in his Masarigaz Alotat, in his ascending prayers, he always makes us remain. If, you, if people pay attention, he does things a little differently than some other bishops. And he specifically always reminds people that this eternal mediation, uh, reconciliation, intercession that we need not ever shy from, that is the hill we're going to die on. We don't care about arguing about pianos, but we will die on the hill of the, the harak enis, the mediation and reconciliation of our Lord, because it is tied to his incarnation or wearing flesh. Yeah, yeah. that's very beautiful. Thank you, uh, Diablo Hanok. Uh, I think, you know, I... We can move on just from there, but just to add on a couple thoughts. Um, first, we'll get to later on um, Makdas and um, what Ephraim has to say about that. But again, just to understand, when we talk about the temple, uh, there were two parts, uh, at least at least two parts that we're concerned with right now, right? Uh, there is Qaddis and there's Qaddis to Qaddusan. And the Qaddis is where the, where the, the priest offers sacrifice. But the Qaddis to Qaddusan, however, only one person can enter the Qaddisat Adusan. That is the high priest. And even at that, once a year on Yom Kippur, on the day of salvation, to offer atonement for all the people. And so this Qaddisat Adusan is not just something you throw around. It's a reference to the holiest of holy places, a place that was so fearsome, so uh, glorious, that attached to the high priest as he entered the room, that is the holiest of holies, was a string and next with a bell. So that if he were to drop dead in the midst of that room, no one else would enter, but they would drag him out using the rope. This is to show you how much, how glorious Our Lady the Virgin Mary is. And even now us as Ethiopian Orthodox Christians inheriting that Semitic tradition of the temple in our own church, we have Kanimahayit as the, as the outer ring, Kadist and then Kadistak Adusan. The sanctuary where our manbar, where our altar is, is called Kandistak Adusan. And whenever we enter this, we as you know, deacons, me and Hinoch, have the privilege of entering the Kandistak Adusan. We remember how glorious it was when our Lord came down from heaven and was made incarnate within the holies of holies of our Lady Mary. Uh, the second thing I want to point out is about the Ten Commandments. And here we see how St. Ephraim calls her the tablet, the, the, the table of covenant, upon which were the Asr Tukalak, the Ten Commandments. And it says in our Andamta how Yod, which is the Hebrew equivalent of Iota, was the first, the beginning of the Ten Commandments. And Yod, or Iota, is also the beginning, as Yad Hino told us, of the name of Jesus Christ, Isu Christe, right? 
or Isu, uh, you know, Jesus Christos. Um, and so here we see a comparison. Just as God by his finger wrote the Ten Commandments on the tablet which he gave to Moses, so God through the finger of the Holy Spirit wrote the word on the tablet which is Our Lady the Virgin Mary. And so we see here the comparison between the Asatuk Alat and Kal, right? We see the comparison between the divine words written for the salvation of the people of Israelites and the one word who wrote those words, who came down for the salvation of the entire world. Um, and the final thing which Gat uh, Hino um, expounds on is Wakona Arad in Hadiskidan. And we say this every year on the greatest Sunday of all Sundays, which is Ba'alit in Sa'i, to open up our Mahalit. The Dusiyari uh, gives for us this opportunity where we sing this with the Izm Zema, which is so uniquely attributed to Sunday. And the reason why we sing this Zema on Ba'alat in Sa'i is to remember that our Lord, through his death and through his holy resurrection, became the mediator for the New Testament, the high priest who entered the Holies of Holies. Because as Yakon Hinok told us, and as our holy Orthodox fathers have told us for the past 2,000 years, because he is fully God and fully man, he brought a reconciliation that no one else can bring between heaven and earth between divinity and humanity. And so because of this, we call him Arak uh, Inad Giskidan. Kedusiari calls him that. Kedus uh, Ephraim calls him that. And we as true Orthodox Christians call him that as well. Um, so I think that's a wonderful stanza to begin this whole thing. Um, the second stanza. And because of this, we beseech you and magnify you, O lady, the pure God bearer, we beseech you and lift our eyes to you so that we may find mercy and compassion of the lover of men. You are the tabot or the tabernacle, which was covered on all its sides with gold and was made of the wood that never perishes and that foreshadowed for us the word of God who became man without separation and change, the pure and undefiled deity, the equal of the father. To you as the pure woman, uh, Gabriel announced him without seed and he became like unto us through the might of his wisdom. He who was incarnate of you and he who was spotless united his nature with ours. Oh, Holy Mary, pray for us. Um, uh, anything that stands out to you from this stanza? I right here is much briefer than the last stanza. I just want to point to from here on out. I mean, we already started in the first one, but I want everyone to focus on what you could call the misali, the illustration, the parabolic teaching or the foreshadowing, or what some theologians refer to as typology. And that is, these are a lot of things from the Older Testament. If you have not read the Hebrew Bible or the Older Testament, you're going to struggle with a lot of these things. And in fact, Udasi Mariam, or this Marian praise, is inviting us to reread the Old Testament and to see the role of Mary. Now, when we do that, we realize everything in the Older Testament, as our Lord Jesus told the scribes and Pharisees, whom he argued with, and the Sadducees, everything that they hold value in the Old Testament speaks about him. And because it speaks about him, who gave birth to him? Our Lady did. And so there's going to be a connection. It's going to talk about him, but it's also talking about her because he became a human being through her. And so beginning in stanza two and really it was in the last stanza two but i just really becomes more and more obvious we see these types we see these shadows that have these meanings in the older testament but that have greater fulfillment when you see them through the lens of the new testament church and when you see them through the eyes of uh with does of this mary in praise you see the role of mary in the older testament and that might be something that's, I think, counterintuitive to some people. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, some of these things we've already talked about, uh, for those of you who are with us in our past series, uh, we talked about Tabot, and within it, the three things, um, the Manna, the Bata'aron, and the Asr Tukalat. So we don't need to go into that in detail. The one thing I'll point out is just, you know, the beauty of the Christology of St. Ephraim. You know, the Kona Seba Azan Badefintet Wayulati, so like, you know, he became man without division, without change, without mingling. That's why I, I don't really like this uh, translation. It's a little faulty 
he mingled his divinity. That's wrong. He united his divinity, right? The you know, kaulat takat and takat, kaulat vahari and vahari. You know, that's what Neophysite Christology, what Tawahedo um, Christology is all about. The divine and the human without mixture, without division, without change, became one united nature, uh, the one composite nature of God the Word, as St. Cyril tells us, in Jesus Christ. Um, and so because of this, because she's the mother of the Savior, we ask her to beseech us at all times. Uh, so I think that's, I think that's uh, a good enough summary of what this is talking about. Uh, the third stanza is pretty small. You are the sanctuary, which the, cherub, which the cherubim who are fashioned in the likeness of God surround. The word who is incarnate of you, O pure woman, without change, has become the forgiver of our sins and the destroyer of our transgressions. O Holy Mary, pray for us. Uh, again, it's short, but I think it's hitting on some of the things we just talked about. Um, you know, Magnus and the second Busan, I think similar things. Um, one thing I'll you know, put as interesting, it says the cherubim who are fashioned in the likeness of God. Here we're kind of, Luz uh, is talking about this, um, this relationship between imagery, iconography, and Christology. Uh, sometimes those who are ignorant about the truth of the gospel say, you shouldn't have icons. Uh, you know, God said, no make any likeness. The same God who said, don't make any likeness on heaven or earth is interestingly enough, the same God who told Moses to make icons and likenesses of cherubim. So what God was telling us in the, in the commandments is not to make icons, but rather to not worship them, to not replace them for him. But instead we see in the Old Testament that the idea of se'lat being ways through which you can see the panim, the face of God um, is integral to the story of scripture. Uh, and the ultimate image, the ultimate icon is Jesus Christ, who Paul tells us is the perfect image of God as we see in Colossians. Um, and he is, of course, the forgiver of our sins. Uh, anything else you would want to add, Diakohim? Deacon Meherat and I are so accustomed to words like this that sometimes we may have, you know, younger audience members who see a word like cherubim, kirube, and they say, oh, I, I, I know someone named kirube. That's my friend. No, 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 no. Kirubel is not your friend. First of all, Kirubel as a singular name uh, confuses me because it's plural. The cherubim are a group or a category of angels. There were a lot of different throne language of the various cultures of the Near East and the people they interacted with. And cherubim is part of that. Seraphim is another part of it. We'll get to seraphim, we're not there now. The Kirubel or the seraphim are those baby-faced angels you see in Western Renaissance art. You say those chubby-cheeked babies that are angels? Those are the cherubim. In, in our iconography, depending on where you go, it's the ones with the really big eyes, and sometimes they're just a head. And sometimes the eyes almost as big as the head, so you see the eyes really big. So it's just, when you, when you view heaven, it's very stratified. There's a lot of hierarchy. There's an order to it. Just like we try to create an order in the church and an order in our life, there is an order in heaven. And amongst that order, the cherubim are one of these people who are often, again, associated with the throne and with throne guards of the various Near Eastern cultures, Canaanite cultures. And so in the context of the religion that Judaism comes out of, these baby-faced angels or these big eyeball-having angels are one category of angel that are protecting the throne. When you remember the Eden or the Edenic paradise, the one who wields a flaming sword and actually excommunicates or exiles Adam and Eve fulfilling the will of God is a, one of the cherubim. And so that, that fire sword wielder is himself a kirub or a cherub. Thank you for clarifying that. You know, sometimes we do miss that, or I would say I do miss that. So um, it's always good to have that. Um, it was not for lack of knowing. It's not for lack of knowing that you miss it. Yeah, I think it's important for all of us, I think, to clarify um, about these names. Um, you know, we say that God dwells on the back of the cherubim, the Zabana uh, and not because he needs them, not, that, not because they can actually carry him, but by his grace, they are his thrones. And because of this, 
they would receive great glory in heaven. They are one of the greatest of the angels. And here we can actually see a little um, comparison between the Kiruved and Our Lady Mary. She did what the, what the cherubim feared to do. Uh, she became the ultimate throne of God. Uh, so I think that was great. Um, the fourth stanza. Anti utu masovawark nisu intawasita mannahavu. You are the holy golden pot wherein the, man, the manna is hidden, the bread which came down from heaven, the giver of life unto all the world. Oh, Holy Mary, pray for us. Uh, Deb Hanok, would you like to open up? Because I think, at least for us, Deb Hanok, this, this stanza hits a little different. <laughs> yeah, I, I would like to see how much into that you're going to get into. <laughs> but um, yeah, we this is a part of the liturgy. So we, we open the liturgy with something that we say on Sundays, something that we say on Saturdays, Fridays, and Wednesdays, and then something that we say on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. And they're different openings. Kulluza Gavra, uh, all that do righteous is the opening on Sundays, Saturday, Friday, and Wednesday. It's Meskal Abraha, the cross illuminates Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. It's uh, so it's we we greet you, our holy church. There are different openings. When we conclude with all three of them, there's also a Paschal one. I'll skip it for now. Uh, but shout out to Yosef when Nicodemus. Uh, right after, we enter and we say Anti Wiltu every time here. Maswaba work. You are the holy and pure golden Maswab. Maswab, we don't even need to translate as pot here might be more confusing when we say that. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people know Masob. In Los Angeles, there's a Masob restaurant. The Masob is the container. And when you open the container, you find the bread or the injera or the himbasha, whatever form that you have at the time. For us, the point is not what type of grain it is. The point for us is that inside of there is sustenance. Mm -hmm. And the ultimate sustenance did not come from the ground. If it came from the ground, it would come through the labor of human hands, and thus it would be an idol, constructed like any other wooden idol or golden idol or silver idol. Instead, for the Israelites in the desert, in the wilderness, who could not provide for themselves because the terrain was so horrible, manna, or what is it, came from the sky because they're accustomed through agriculture, through their own force, making bread but now bread or sustenance came to them from heaven every day and twice for the sabbath so that they didn't have to work too hard to collect it and the ultimate fulfillment of that of course is our lord jesus christ who was born through this holy of holies who is our lady the holy virgin mary and so every time we see a masob we need to think about how our lady the holy virgin mary gave birth to our manna, who is Jesus. Mm. Yes, very beautiful. Uh, I want to point out here, part of the beauty of Sunday um, is that Kedus Ephraim uses this day to compare Our Lady Mary to the Noahic to Noah and Desach, right? The um, different uh, things that we use within the sanctuary, which are used in the temple of the Old Testament. So we see Mesoark, Tekwam Zawark, Might and Zawark, and we'll see all of them on. But Masobawark is not just something we see in the Old Testament, but we, as part of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, use a Masobawark. Uh, in fact, every time at the beginning of Gaddasi, the Diakon carries the Masobawark on his head and carries it from and carries the the Hibist from Beit Hadihim to the Beit Hamakdas. That's why we are saying anti wutu Masobawark, to show that this Masobawark, which came from Bethlehem and is coming to the altar, is representing Our Lady Mary. And within the Masobawark, is the hibist, the, the, the bread which came down from heaven, which is Jesus Christ. And we talked about this yesterday. Jesus says in, I believe, John chapter 6, your forefathers ate manna in the desert and they died. I am the bread which came down from heaven. I am the bread of life. So this is not just an analogy. This is a direct reference to the teachings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, so this is, again, also a warning to all of us. I think, you know, maybe not for people our age that are a little younger, but for people on the older side, uh, partaking of the bread of life seems to be something that's at the bottom of our bucket list. Uh, and so 
Again, this is the bread which gives life to all those who partake of it. If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have life within you. If you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life within you. Uh, so I think we should remember and reflect on that when we're looking at the stanza. Yeah, one, one point I want to add here before we move on is that in our culture especially, there is a very strong, and this analogy has been made before, but we Semites use repetition for emphasis. There's a very strong culture. If you're a guest in someone's house and they bring you food, even if you're not hungry, even if you already ate, they'll tell you at least go through the motion, at least accept it, go through the motion and eat what you've been served. Now, I don't wanna call you a guest in the house of God, but ultimately we're all guests because it's his house, it's none of ours. It's our house in that he invites us to it, but it's ultimately his house. And so when we're a guest in the house of the Lord, and when unlike all other religions who are demanding human sacrifice and for, for animal sacrifice, for you to feed the gods, our God says, eat me. Mm. Of all the things, he flips it on his head. He says, eat me, I am the sacrifice. I am the kurban. Eat me and you'll get more kirb. You'll get closer. And for us to turn it down, I think is the height of rudeness. In fact, I don't want to cause amas or rebellion, but it would be better for you to take communion and to say no and be considered rude by other people to the food in their houses than for you to be rude to the Lord. And in fact, in the Lord's house, it's not about being rude. It's about missing the mark. Mm. Yes, that's uh, missing the mark. For those of you who maybe not have gotten the subtle reference, that is the, what sin is by definition. Sin in the Greek is missing the mark. Uh, so that's, uh, I'm forgetting the Greek, the actual Greek term, um, but that's great, that's wonderful. And I would, you know, to add to that analogy, it's not even about uh, maybe we're full and we don't need the food. You know, this analogy for us in Urban is we are starving, starving, like we haven't eaten 5 million years. We're about to die. And someone's giving us the juiciest, biggest steak you've ever seen and for us to turn it down it's not just rudeness it's madness you're about to die you have to take of it so not to call people who partake of it mad or anything but when we look at the actual action uh it just doesn't make sense so uh that said with love um everyone should draw near to that gavata, that banquet um stanza five anti you are the golden candlestick and hold the brilliant light at all times, the light which is the light of the world, the light of lights which had no beginning, verily God of God, who became incarnate of you without change. And by his coming, he shed light upon us, uh, upon those of us who are sitting in the shadow and darkness of death. And he set our feet upon the path of peace through the mystery of his holy wisdom. O Holy Mary, pray for us. Uh, I guess I'll go. Um, so Tepam Zawar, the golden candlestick, is obviously a reference to the Old Testament, the candle of the temple, which had to be on, that is a light, at all times, 24-7, because there was no natural light inside the temple. The priest did all his things within the light of that golden candlestick. Um, and so he compares it to Our Lady Mary. She is the candle. The light is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who said, I am the light of the world. Uh, and the, the oil by which that candle burns is the Holy Spirit, who was able to bring forth light from the candle, which is Our Lady, the Virgin Mary. Uh, and then uh, St. Ephraim brilliantly makes a reference to the prayer of faith, the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed, Brahan Zem Brahan, right? Light from light, true God from true God, which referenced the fact that this son of God is not a futur, as the heretic Arius would say, but rather he is of one essence with the Father. He is consubstantial with the Father. He was before eternity, before time, before all things, in, equal, in, in equality uh, and in authority with the Father. Uh, and then I think, I think that's good for now. I'll, I'll, I'll pass it over to you, Dekwahim. Building off what Deacon Mehrad said, I wish I had a tuaf as a prop right now. I've mentioned this to you all in person before, 
But Pope Shenouda, in his book on comparative theology, was talking about why we have candlesticks or candles in our church. And when you look, the candle itself has a shadow because it is a physical object. And that's what physical objects typically do, is they cast a shadow. However, the fire, which is the light upon the candlestick, on the taquam or the tuaf, when you look at it, there's no shadow. In the Janine literature, we hear, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And so when we look at the tuaf, the taquam, the candle or the candlestick, we say, wow, the candle is Our Lady, the Holy Virgin Mary. And from her, our Lord Jesus became a human being. But he's no normal human being. He's also the light which produces light itself, that which we're able to see in the dark. As he mentioned in the, in the sanctuary, in the holy place, you have to use the light to see where you're going, which is the perfect illustration for our lives. Jesus is not someone to be relegated to Sundays. You can't trap Jesus on Sundays at a specific time from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. or 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. when the simkat is on or the sermon is on. No. Every single day has to be dedicated to God, which is why I've only sadly been able to participate in two, so an eifar and a binyat. But I'll be judged. But Mehrat has been able to faithfully show you how each and every single day is given to God. We can't compartmentalize him. We can't trap him. He is the God of all times, the God of all places. And we learn how to live our lives. We analyze politics, philosophy, music, history, every part of our lives with Jesus as the lens. Mm. We cannot say, oh, he's only about religion. No, no, no. He has to seep into everything. In The Wizard of Oz, maybe I'm dating myself with this reference, but if you've ever seen it, in The Wizard of Oz, they enter the Emerald City. In the Emerald City, you have emerald colored glasses so that everything you see is green. We need to put Jesus glasses on as Mary wore him inside of her, we need to wear Jesus as glasses and see every single day through him and through him being born of the Holy Virgin Mary. And that way we'll be in the proud tradition of Ephraim the Syrian. That's wonderful. Uh, yeah, I think that's wonderful. Uh, and we see here, just to put before we move on, a slight reference to scripture. Uh, those who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. That's straight from scripture. Uh, and uh, this is just to show to you again, this is from old, the Old Testament, as uh, Yaakun Hinoch told us, the importance of reading the Old Testament. We shouldn't uh, develop the kind of the Martianite um, interpretation of the Bible saying the New Testament is all, the, all, the only part we need to read. Both have been given for our salvation. Um, so that's wonderful. Uh, the sixth stanza, I think, in my opinion, my favorite stanza. Uh, you are the censor of gold because you did carry the coal of the blessed fire which he took from the sanctuary. He who forgives sin and destroys wickedness. He who is the word of God became incarnate of you and who offered up to his father incense and precious offering. Oh, Holy Mary, pray for us. Uh, uh, what's your take on this? First of all, most people don't even know what this word is. Let's be frank. In Giz, we call it Maitant. In Amharic, it's called Tena or Sena. In English, it's called Censor. And when we say Censor, they think we're, we mean with an O-R. They don't understand the E-R. So first of all, people have issue with this word. I've seen even some of our multitude of young deacons, they say, hey, can you pass me the thing? They, they don't even know what it's called. And so this is a very important line, because if we don't know what it's called, we will not catch the reference of how Mary means this thing. So maybe I'll focus on what this thing is, and you can explain to us how Mary is this thing. So, 
sensor, C-E-N-S-E-R. It is, for all intents and purposes, what an, an uninformed person would call a smoke machine, an ancient smoke machine, right? We have incense or frankincense that we put on coals that are burning, and they produce a smell, a fragrance, right? A very positive fragrance. And, and some people say that there's, there's some elements to it that, that may have an effect on mood, may put you in a, in a good spirit. And it, it spreads in the atmosphere and it rises like smoke. Now it's dangerous because in the beginning of the scroll of Isaiah, we hear that God no longer wants their incense because they focus so much on the incense and they've forgotten to live their lives according to his will. And so we have to make sure that we live our lives according to our will so that he may accept our prayers as he accepts the incense, which we are having lifted up in the air, which shoots out of the censer as we're dangling it back and forth. And I say we, it's, it's the priests, but uh, we hold it sometimes and, and, and pass it over to them. Thank you. Wonderful. That's a wonderful uh, definition. I, I think it's important for us to um, acclimate ourselves to the vocabulary of the church. Uh, otherwise, we're going to struggle to understand a lot of the teachings of the church. So as Hinoch said, Yakwa Hinoch said, the censer is a thing that we swing or the thing that the priest swings with the incense. Um, so Our Lady is called the censer, the Mayatant, because inside of the Mayatant, as you may see, there is a coal, a coal which is, you know, with fire. And this Ephraim says that this coal is, represents our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is very much similar to what St. Cyril of Alexandria says concerning our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The coal represents his humanity. The fire with which that coal is smoking is his divinity. The coal and the fire are in perfect unis unison. You can't divide uh, the, the coal from the fire once it has united. And their attributes also exchange. The coal receives the attribute of heat and brightness from the fire. And the fire receives the attributes of weight and physicality from the coal. And so in the same way, the human nature and the divine nature became one composite nature, united without separation for even the, the blink of an eye, as our Dasi says, in Jesus Christ. And so she is the one that carried this fire without being burned, as Yusyari says in today's Mazmur, the, the fire of divinity did not burn her. Another thing I want to mention is the fact that he calls her Ma'it and Zawark, just like he called her Tabam Zawark, just as he called her Masobo, uh, Masobo This is to reference her purity, just as gold is pure and undefiled. So Our Lady, in purity and holiness, carried this coal, which is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the final thing I want to mention is that it says he offers up to his father incense. Just as the priest offers up incense, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as the perfect high priest offers up the greatest offering which anyone can offer to God, which is his own flesh and blood. That is what the offering is. That's the same offering which we bring to the altar every week on Sunday. That same one eternal offering made for us on Good Friday on the Holy Cross. Uh, and so this is important for us to understand. Um, it's very scriptural. It's based on the work of the temple and the work of our church. So we say, Sa'adi um, Danikabis, O Holy Mary, pray for us. The seventh stanza, uh, it's the, the translation is completely erroneous. So we're going we're gonna to try and translate it um, off, off the cuff. Tafasihi O Mariam Rug Sennait, Zawar Kidena Zabir Kale. Rejoice, O Mary, the gentle dove. You bore for us the word of God. You are the flower which sprung from the root of Jesse who brought for us the great fragrance. Oh, Holy Mary, pray for us. Um, Dagwin Hanok, any comments, any thoughts on the stanza? We are fast approaching the new year. And, you know, after the new year happens and after we get past Mascal and everything, we have one of these funny periods in the church. I say funny because it's called the voluntary fast. We have more fasting days than non-fasting days, and yet something is called a voluntary fast on top of the seven mandatory fasts. And that is Suomesage, or the fast of the flower, or the fast of Zemanesage, or Warhasage, the era of the flower, or the month of the flower. 
And so during Sege, or the season of the flower, much like what we've been talking about here, this typology is there's a sense in which by Sege, we mean Our Lady, the Holy Virgin Mary. And there's a sense in which by Sege, we mean the Lord Jesus. Just like a lot of these analogies, we, we can say this is how it means Mary and this is how it means Jesus because they are working in tandem together, her by giving birth, him by being the one who was birthed. So here, Tafasihi o Mare Amrigbesan Night, she is being called this gentle or beautiful or good dove because it says there, because she gave birth to the word of God or the word of the Lord. And it says here that she is this fragrant and good and beautiful flower that is from the root of Jesse. Jesse, as we mentioned earlier, is the father of David. When we open up, even for example, our New Testament, we keep seeing references to the Older Testament, as I said. You can find Jesse in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter one, in the lineage of the Lord. You can find him in the lineage of the Lord in the Gospel according to Luke, chapter three. You can find him in the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 13. And you can find him in Romans, which itself is directly quoting from the scroll of Isaiah. So if we want to understand Udasi Mariam, we have to go read Romans, Acts of the Apostles, Luke, Matthew, Isaiah, and so on and so forth to figure out who is this Jesse. It's certainly not Jesse Jackson. It's certainly not Jesse James. It's Jesse who begat David, the king, the prophet, and the cantor. And so we need to understand what is the importance of this prophecy of the root of Jesse and why is Our Lady being referenced to it. We need to understand that within all these places that seem to be desert, within all these places uh, you know, that seem to lack productive nature, we see flowers springing up. And so whenever we see a flower, now we need to think of Our Lady, the Holy Virgin Mary, and we need to think of our Lord Jesus. So it's, it's beautiful when we see a candlestick, when we see a censer, when we see a holy place, when we see a masob, all these times we're going to be thinking of our Lord and our Lady. I mean, very true. Uh, and just, you know, to add, this just shows how important the holy books are. There are those in the West, again, out of ignorance, it's not out of malice, I hope, that say, I don't need these holy books. I don't need these writings. All I need is my Bible and I'm good. But the problem is, the Bible, as we know, is dense. The Bible is not something you can easily read. And so what allows for us to be able to draw that life out of the word of God, which is how, which is living even now, is by being able to use the interpretations given to us by our holy fathers, who again received their teachings from the patristic fathers, the, the disciples of the apostles, who received it from the holy apostles, who received it from Jesus Christ. So these holy books, these prayers that we pray every day, hopefully, you know, by the end of this series, I am hoping that all of you who are listening can take this to heart and read and reflect the, the, the praise of our Holy Mary every day. The reason why we have these is to show for us the beauty of the Old Testament, the beauty of the New Testament, the beauty of the living word of God. And so I think I have nothing else to add. You know, the flower, Mary, the fragrance of Jesus Christ. Um, that's a very beautiful exposition. Uh, we're nearing the end. Everyone, we can hang on. We got two more stanzas. Uh, stanza eight. Betra Aron in Tesaretet, Zen Bedetet, Waisak Ayuwa Maya. You are like unto the rod of Aaron, which without being planted in the ground and without watering burst into blossom. In like manner, you, O bearer of Christ, did bring forth Christ our God in truth. Christ our God in truth without sea. He came and delivered us. O oh, Holy Mary, pray for us. Um, this is, again, another direct reference to scripture. Uh, Diagon Hino, if you want to clarify for us about this. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it short on this one It's because it's related. It's another flower, and it, it relates to the last topic. I had to hold myself back. I almost started talking about this one when I glanced at my notes there that break the fourth wall for everybody. So, again, there's the desert, 
there's the wilderness. It's viewed as a place where the human being cannot provide for themselves. They have to be dependent on God. For us, that sucks. The same thing for God is great because it means that we are dependent on him. We acknowledge that he alone provides. When we start doing agriculture, when we start farming, when we start building cities, when we start building walls and start expanding, having expansionist empires, that is when we think we're independent. That's where we're like, oh, that God guy, who needs him? But when we are in the wilderness, we depend on him. So when they were in the wilderness, the manna that we discussed earlier, it was counterintuitive. It didn't come from the ground. It came from the sky, from the heaven. In the same fashion, you look at a bat, a rod, and it's, a, it's, it's nothing that should be producing flowers. And yet, from something that should not be producing flowers, a flower was produced. From someone who did not go through the normal process of baby making, a baby was produced. And that baby was produced in Our Lady, the Holy Virgin Mary. And that baby was, of course, the baby Jesus. Mm. Yes, very true. And again, a reference to the rod of Aaron, which, as scripture tells us, brought forth fruit without being, you know, planted into the, into the, to the ground. Again, which is why we compare it to Mary, who had no seed of man uh, and brought for us uh, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Uh, the last stanza. It is meet for you, all you who are full of grace, more than all the saints, to pray on our behalf. You are greater than the high, uh, you are greater than the bishops, the archbishops, and you are more honorable than the prophets. In you there is majesty of appearance, which is greater than the majesty of the seraphim and cherubim. Verily, you are the glory of our race, and you are she who must beg for life for our souls. Pray you then on our behalf to our Lord and Redeemer, Jesus Christ, that he may confirm us in the right faith. That is to say, faith in him, and that he may graciously bestow upon us his mercy and compassion, and may in his abundant mercy forgive us our sins. Uh, o Holy Mary, pray for us. Uh, I guess I'll go. Uh, this is the last stanza. Here, St. Ephraim, he's finishing up, essentially, not just this... Um, him, but you know almost all the hymns this is the last uh the last one amongst all of them and he ends by saying by kind of expounding on what he means by Sa'adi Danakadis throughout all the hymns 64 times he says Sa'adi Danakadis one for each year of our lady mary's life and on this last stanza the 64th Sa'adi Danakadis he says why we should say Sa'adi Danakadis because she is greater than the archbishops of the new testament the prophets of the old testament the uh, apostles of the New Testament, the kings of the Old Testament, whether it is old, whether it is new, whether it's BC, whether it's AD, Our Lady Mary, Mariam Ta'abdi Kullu Fitrat, she is greater than all of creation. Why? Because she is the mother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is meet, that is, it is worthy that she may be our interceder, that she may pray on our behalf at the foot of the throne of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that what? So that he may confirm us. That is not just confirm us. I think that's uh, that it's not doesn't bring the full translation. that he may keep us. That he may uh, allow uh, cause for us to endure in the true orthodox that is straight faith. And so, verily, just as we ask for our friends to pray for for us, so we must ask for our great mother, our Lady, the Holy Virgin Mary, to pray for us at all times. Um, anything to add to close out for us? It, it's funny. You could read what I wrote. Mehrat and I did. Deacon Mehrat and I did not even exchange notes. I wrote exactly that. If you have, this is just advice I'm going to give out. If you have ever, ever, ever asked anyone to pray for you, okay, then you'll have to also ask Our Lady, the Holy Virgin Mary. Now, if you think you're an island to yourself and you never ask anyone to pray for you, all right, then leave it alone. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm going to take it a step further. Every year at Dumkat at Theophany, we have some of these Q&A, these question and answer sessions. And I want to rip my hair out sometimes. Everyone wants to ask, why do you guys worship Mary? Why do you guys worship Gabriel? Da, 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 da. We go through these arguments. We don't worship them. We worship one God. And we worship this one God in relatively the same fashion for almost millennia, for sure, for centuries. So I want to encourage all of you, 
those of you who have the love of Our Lady, the Holy Virgin Mary in your heart, do not debate people about Our Lady, the Holy Virgin Mary. Do not argue with them. They are either going to accept or reject, and they're going to play games with you. Spend your time on three things. Learn about the Holy Virgin Mary as, as we are learning together. Teach about the Holy Virgin Mary as we are teaching together. And finally, to make sure that you're not a hypocrite, live a life like she lived. Live humbly. Live in fasting. Live in prayer. Live in almsgiving. Live a life close to his sanctuary or to his holy place and doing good deeds. It does not suit your arguments in defense or in advocacy of Our Lady, the Holy Virgin Mary, if you have a Gosquala Hiwat, if you have an ugly life that is corrupt and that is in the mud. So make sure to keep yourself pure as she is the pure amongst the pure and make sure that you're able to teach people, do not debate with them, but teach them. And in order to teach, you must learn. So spend your time as Deacon Mehrat and I have, and you could learn about the Holy Virgin Mary, teach about the Holy Virgin Mary, and you can live like the Holy Virgin Mary. I mean, I mean, ultimately, what we have to say when we encounter ignorance like this is to say, Lord, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Uh, we have kept this, the, the correct teaching of our fathers for 2,000 years. For 2,000 years, our fathers have called on the name of, the, of Our Lady Mary, have asked for her prayers, because they realize that it's not just about Mary, but it's the fact that who, who is Mary pointing to? Look at the icons of our church. Always her head is inclined. Always her fingers pointed to her beloved son. What did she say at the wedding of Cana? She says, do what he tells you to do. That's why we implore for her to be with us. That's why we implore for her to pray for us so that we can be closer to our Savior, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is why I always say, I've said it for the past couple of days, anyone who professes to love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, must call Our Lady Mary his mother. It doesn't get any simpler than that. And so with that said, we have finished Basalam Xavier with the peace of God, this final hymn, this great hymn um, that was written by our father, Kudus Ephraim Soriawi, for the greatest day amongst all days, the day of the Sabbath of the Christians, Sanda uh, Tatuskan Kudus. And so, Diakon Heno, I want to first start by thank you very much for coming. Just as you uh, started us off with a blast, so you are in a way finishing off with the blast. I know we're going to circle back on Tuesday, but uh, we finished this last hymn with you with a blast. And to all of you who are with us for this program from start to finish, thank you very much. Spread the word, not just by sharing this video or whatever, but also as Diakon Hinoch said, by telling people about this stuff, telling people about the news of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, telling them about the love and the news of our Lady, the Virgin Mary. So that said, May glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. And may the prayers and intercession of Our Lady Mary uh, be with all of us. Uh, thank you. We'll see you guys uh, on Tuesday at 10 o'clock a.m. Uh, we're going to finish off um, with our final reflection on the remainder of the hymn for Tuesday. Uh, everyone have a blessed day. Thank you. <laughs>